Good morning. I'll be <clears throat> preaching this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, beginning with the second half of verse 16. John, chapter 19, verse 16. And, uh, here we read, So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic and Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. But Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots. For it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothes, clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. He said to his mother, Woman, Behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took, took her to his home. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. And so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, bringing, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. And so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as it is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been yet laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Thus far the reading of God's word. Would you please pray with me? Father, your word is the bread of life, which brings nourishment to sinful, sick, and world-weary souls. Would you enable us now by your Holy Spirit to feed on your word by faith, that we might believe more deeply in the finished work of Christ our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. On January 12th, 2007, the D.C. morning commute 
uh, through the L'Enfant Plaza metro station was very much like every other morning commute. Uh, the shoe shine was just about to open. The line at the lotto kiosk was beginning to form, and commuters were hustling to work, uh, trying not to spill their coffee, which they're not allowed to have on the metro, but they do anyway. The scene was perfectly ordinary, except for one thing. That the perfectly ordinary looking young man in blue jeans and a ball cap playing the violin at the entrance of the station was none other than the world famous concert violinist Joshua Bell. Just three days earlier, Bell had filled Boston Symphony Hall, where the average ticket cost $100. Two weeks later, he would perform at the Strathmore uh, to a standing room only crowd. And yet, out of the 1,097 people who passed Bell during his 43-minute concert at the metro station, only seven stopped to listen. Uh, Bell's metro performance, you see, was part of an experiment that had been put together by the Washington Post. It was an experiment designed to examine how our context and our perception and our expectation and our priorities will shape our judgments and our behavior. L'Enfant Plaza is an ordinary place, an unexpected place for a world-class musical performance. It's an unexpected time for a world-class musical performance. Joshua Bell, for his part, wasn't exactly dressed like a world-class uh, violinist. There, was no, there were no announcements, there was no fanfare, there were no flyers announcing such a performance. And as a result, 1,090 people passed him by, missing a performance of a lifetime. When Pontius Pilate placed a sign that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, above Jesus' head on the cross, he undoubtedly meant for it to mock Jesus. Pilate was saying here, in effect, this is what Rome does to rival kings. He meant to mock Jesus, and in all likelihood, he, he meant to mock the Jewish religious leaders as well. These religious leaders, you'll remember, had pressured Pilate into crucifying a man in whom he had found no guilt. Pilate was annoyed. And so here publicly displays Rome's superiority and authority over the Jewish people. Uh, the leaders, feeling the, the sting of Pilate's jab, ask him to change the sign. They say, could you write, this man said I am king of the Jews. And Pilate responds with a sort of final, pathetic display of his authority, what I have written, I have written. You see, for both the Jews and the Romans of Jesus' day, a cross was the last place they would ever expect to find a king. For the Romans, a king on a cross is a failed king. There's no king at all. For the Jews, a man on the cross was the ultimate incontrovertible proof that whatever else this man may be, he was not the Messiah because a Messiah would not be found hanging and dying on a cross. But in the text before us this morning, what we see is that what, what Pilate meant as sarcastic mockery and what the Jews, J Jewish leaders saw as a, as a misleading lie, God meant as an announcement of the truth of the gospel, a gospel which would change the world, just as the high priest Caiaphas, a few chapters earlier, would say more than he intended, you'll remember, when he declared that it is better for one man to die for the people uh, than for a whole nation to perish. So to hear Pilate in his mocking announces to the world the truth, that Jesus is in fact, the king of the Jews. And not the Jews only, but all of God's people, Jew and Gentile. And so, here we're reminded, aren't we, 
John gives us an important reminder that the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities are not the ultimate authority. There is another authority at work here. The last words that Jesus speaks to Pilate before he goes to the cross are these, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. God is the one who is working. God is the one who has authority. And God is the one who is working even through the greatest tragedy the world has ever seen to accomplish a salvation that is greater than the world could ever imagine. And this authority from above is in fact at work here even at the cross. Even through the wickedness and the malice of the religious leaders, God is at work accomplishing his purpose to redeem sinners through the shed blood of the incarnate Son. What the world would have seen as incontrovertible proof that Jesus is anything but a king and a Messiah is in fact the very means by which Jesus is established as both king and savior of the world. And this is important to see that it is not as if Jesus becomes king despite the humiliation of the cross. But John is telling us that it is precisely through the humiliation of the cross that the Son of God is enthroned as king and secures salvation for his people. And John highlights the character of Christ's kingship here for us. The character of Christ's kingship and the character of his kingdom. And he does so through a series of these paradoxes that we see throughout his account. These paradoxes, things which which don't seem to go together at all, and yet are true. The first paradox that we see in John's account is that Jesus on the cross gains through losing. He gains through losing. It was the, uh, the Roman custom that the executioners had a right to the clothes of those whom they executed. And so John tells us here in verse 23 that Jesus' garments were divided four ways among the soldiers. But not being able to divide up his tunic at least easily, uh, they cast lots for it, probably rolling dice there at the foot of the cross to determine which of the four soldiers would take home Jesus' tunic. Now there would have been nothing particularly remarkable about this, this scene Uh, The the soldiers weren't doing anything illegal or even necessarily malicious. But as John looks on this scene, what he sees is the fulfillment of Scripture, of Psalm 22, in which we read, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Uh, Here, David recounts something of his own experience, an experience of abandonment, of feeling forsaken by both God and man, a feeling of desperate suffering. Uh, You'll remember how the psalm opens with that that gut-wrenching cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, David goes on, he says, I am poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots." It's a gruesome portrait, isn't it? It's a portrait of a man utterly forsaken and without hope, without recourse. And yet, as far as we know, David never himself experienced such suffering, at least in these particulars. This suffering that is so dramatically depicted in this psalm, David here pens as as a poetic description of his suffering, And yet, John sees it as, in fact, prophetic. David, as he 
describes his experience prophesies of the suffering and the humiliation that the Christ would endure. And for Christ, there is nothing poetic about this suffering. He suffered it in full. He experienced this dereliction in a way David could never have even imagined. And in so doing, and in so doing, he becomes the ultimate forsaken one, uh, that uh, Messiah whom David foretold. And perhaps as a, a symbol of the depth of Christ's loss, uh, he is deprived even of his clothes. Uh, the most basic necessities of life here are gone as the soldiers roll dice for the last of Jesus' clothes. Here we see Jesus has nothing left by way of worldly possessions. We don't have reason to think that he had very many of them to begin with. Uh, but here, the very little he had is taken away. It is debated whether or not Jesus was even allowed to keep his, his loincloth. But the majority opinion seems to be that Jesus would have been crucified naked, exposed, ashamed. This public exposure contributing to his humiliation. Here we see Jesus losing everything and at the end being deprived of even the most basic necessities of life. Human clothing, you'll remember, has its origin in God's gracious provision. It's provision for the first man, Adam, and here we see it being removed from the second. As one pastor put it, that God could put clothing upon the first Adam only because he would one day take it off the second Adam. For clothing represented grace, but all grace must depart from the Christ. There was no grace for Christ that day. Only judgment, only wrath. And as the soldiers are rolling dice for the last of Jesus' clothing, the Son of God appears to have lost everything. But then we read verse 21, where John says, So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. I imagine you're aware that there's been a great deal of ink spilled over what exactly is going on here. And I don't presume to solve all of those problems uh, for you this morning. Uh, Dr. Crow said he'll solve them all for you after uh, in the hallway, <laughs> so you can ask him. But I think what we see is at least this. At least this. In Jesus' words to John and to his mother, he is forming a new family. We see here the start of a new community, a community that's being formed around the cross. And though by all appearances Jesus has lost everything, what Jesus sees in Mary and what he sees in John is the sapling that will grow up into the full tree, which will be his church, the body of believers, the family of Christ, for whom he was at that very moment shedding his blood. Mary becomes John's spiritual mother. John becomes Mary's spiritual son. He's looking at John, seeing in John the apostle whose apostolic testimony will form the foundation of the church. Do you see a new community being formed here? No longer are God's people delineated according to the law of Moses, but according to the, the grace and the truth that is found in Christ. By every appearance and according to any human measure, of this scene, Jesus has lost everything. But looking down from the cross, Jesus sees his reward. But Jesus looks out and sees his most prized possession, his church. And what does he do? He commands them, in effect, to love one another, to care for one another. The moment of his greatest suffering, we see Jesus' selflessness. We see his concern for others. We see his love 
for his church. And we're reminded, aren't we, of the selfless and sacrificial love to which we are all called. Jesus here not stopping caring for his people. And Jesus hasn't stopped even this day as he continues to care for his people through his church, through the love the body of believers has for, for one another. And so let me ask you, dear friends, is this how you regard the church of Christ? Is this how you will regard the church of Christ when you're in ministry? Will you regard those sheep entrusted to your care as Christ's most prized possession? Those for whom he died. You know, there's a, an account of an early church deacon known as St. Lorenzo, a third century deacon of Rome. And the story uh, goes something like this. Uh, that it was during Valerian's persecution of the Christians during the third century that a prefect of Rome demanded the treasuries of the Roman church. Uh, he needed this treasure to support his troops for war, and he asks for, that Lorenzo hand over all the treasures of the church, and Lorenzo asks if he could have some time to gather them together. He's given a few days, and in fact, it's a week later that the prefect arrives and demands the church's treasures. And Lorenzo brings out the decrepit, the blind, the poor, the maimed, the orphans and the widows, and he presents them to the prefect. And he says, here are the church's treasures. And he was martyred. He was martyred for uh, his, his Kurt. And yet he makes a profound theological statement, doesn't he? These are the true treasures of the church. It's not the buildings. It's not the, 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 the budgets. But it's the people for whom Christ died. This is Christ's reward. This is Christ's treasure. Not the things of this world, clothes which will perish, gold and silver which will tarnish and can be stolen, but sinners, redeemed by his blood. We see here Jesus losing everything by the world's estimation. And yet Jesus, we see, in fact, gains a people for himself. That's the first paradox we see in John's account. Then the second is this. We see in Jesus' crucifixion that Jesus is victorious in defeat. Jesus is victorious in defeat. On the surface, Jesus' final cry, it is finished, and the notice that he bows his head and gives up his spirit. This sounds very much like a man who's been defeated. Right? A king who's been conquered and who cries out in, in relief that the pain and the suffering and the sorrow is over. And he can finally give up. But in the context, it's, it's clear that Jesus' cry is not a cry of one who's been defeated. But of a, it's a cry of one who has been victorious. It's a cry of triumph. It's a cry of mission accomplished. But what is it exactly that Christ has finished? Well, throughout John's gospel, Jesus has been speaking about his coming from his Father in order to complete the work that he's been given. Uh, he's been called to fulfill the will of his Father. Think, for example, of John 4, verse 34, where Jesus says that my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Uh, John 6, 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 14, 31, As I, I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. And so as Jesus on the cross takes a sip of sour wine and breathes his last and gives up his spirit, he announces that he has finished. He has accomplished all that his Father has sent him to do. Verse 28, Jesus, knowing that all is now finished, said to fulfill Scripture, I thirst. Here, probably an allusion to Psalm 69, in which the psalmist says, They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Here, Jesus, receiving this sour wine, gives up his spirit to, 
but it's striking. It's striking that the the words John uses here to, to describe Christ's final, ultimate fulfillment of Scripture is not the words he's been using elsewhere. This is to fulfill the Scripture, verse 24. But here in verse 28, John says this, in order to finish the Scripture. In order to finish the Scripture. In fact, this word finished is used three times in just three verses. For John, you see, the death of Christ, the the, the, the death that Christ uh, accomplishes there on the cross in a very real way brings God's work to completion. All of God's promises are fulfilled. That promise which be, was given so long ago made uh, through the serpent to Adam in which God says, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall bruise your heel. Here it is accomplished. That bruising of the heel, which was necessary for the crushing of the serpent's head, it is here accomplished. Of course, this is an announcement in Genesis 3.15 that God would one day overthrow the serpent, that ancient serpent of old, and he would destroy all of his evil works one day, He will deal the final death blow. But this death blow would come at a great cost to the seed of the woman. In the process of crushing the head of the serpent, the Messiah would himself suffer a mortal wound. And here we see it. Here we see it. This is God's saving work. It had been announced and reiterated time and again. Countless times to Israel, in types and in shadows, throughout the law, throughout the sacrifices, throughout the prophets, that God would one day triumph over sin and over death and all that would threaten his people. And John is saying that here, in the death of Christ, all is fulfilled. All is fulfilled and all is finished. It is all accomplished. That work of obedience to his Father, that work of obedience living as our obedient representative, and dying in our place as our sacrificial substitute. Jesus says in John 3.13 that no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And Jesus here is, of course, speaking of his crucifixion. That as he is lifted up, hanging on the cross, in a public spectacle of defeat, he is in fact accomplishing the greatest victory history has ever known. He's plundering the kingdom of Satan, setting the captives free. And so we're told that Jesus bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Uh, Jesus says earlier, no one takes my life from me. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up. Jesus willingly gives up his spirit. And in so doing, he accomplishes all of his Father's will. Uh, This fact of redemption, a redemption accomplished, this fact announced by Jesus himself on the cross that when he says it is finished, this has rightly become the source of comfort and the source of assurance for Christians in every age who doubt, who struggle, who wonder if God could in fact love them, who fear that there is more to do. Here Jesus preaches. It is finished. It is accomplished. All that is necessary for the salvation of sinners is finished. Jesus does not say, I have done my part. Now you do yours. Jesus doesn't just make it possible for his people to be saved. But it is finished. He accomplishes it. It is done. This is important for us to keep in mind, of course. Because as we look around our world, it seems, by all appearances, that evil is doing quite well. It's thriving, prospering even. And it's hard for us to see 
that Christ has in fact defeated evil. And so we must turn again and again to the cross uh, to be reminded uh, that Christ is victorious, that he has triumphed, and we must live by faith. You know, Shakespeare wrote different types of plays, two of the most basic being comedies and tragedies. And in the middle of any given play, you don't exactly know what you're watching. Tragedies have some comic elements, and comedies have some fairly sad bits as well. It's not until you get to the end. It's not until you get to the end of the play where either everyone dies and you discover you're watching a tragedy, or there's a wedding, and you see that what you've been watching all along is a comedy. The cross announces to us every day that what we are living is not a tragedy, but a comedy. The story that God has written is not one in which death triumphs, but rather one in which there's a wedding, a wedding supper of the Lamb, and an eternal life which will go on forever and forever. Christ has been victorious, and it's the cross of Christ where we see uh, the fulfillment of that ancient promise that God will overthrow and destroy all that is evil. And this brings us to the final paradox, and that is that in cr the crucifixion of Christ, uh, we see uh, that life comes out of death. In John 35, John emphasizes for us that he is writing this account as an eyewitness, and that he wants us to be absolutely sure that Jesus died. He didn't, as some have suggested, faint. He didn't pass out. He didn't play dead. He died. And in his account here, John is saying, in effect, I was there. I saw it. And I saw also, John says, the Roman soldier who, in order to speed up the dying process, came to break the legs of the crucified. The point of this was uh, to prevent the dying from being able to push themselves up on the small platform uh, under their feet. Uh, they would push themselves up to breathe uh, b before having, out of exhaustion, to lower themselves again and to suffocate which would be the ultimate cause of de the death of a crucified person. Breaking the legs, of course, then would have caused the crucified to, to suffocate more quickly. But John tells us that when they get to Jesus, they see that, that he is already dead, verse 33. And so they do not break his legs. A Roman soldier knew a dead man when they saw one. And so seeing that he was already dead, dead, they don't break his legs, but rather they thrust a spear into his side. And John tells us that at once there came out blood and water. Blood and water. What is the significance of the blood and the water here? Well, for one, it was evidence of Jesus' death. It was common in both Jewish and Greek thought to regard the human body of, as consisting of two basic elements, blood and water. And these two elements flow from Jesus' side, confirming the reality of his death, lest there be any doubt that Jesus suffered physically and that he died physically. Here is evidence of a physical death as these basic elements of life come pouring from out of Jesus' side. But more than that, more than that, John intends for us to see that from this very real death comes a very real life. As the author of the letter to the Hebrews tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That blood which had been shed for generation upon generation, the blood of countless sacrifices, which symbolized the purification of sins, which pictured the covering of an atonement, these could not themselves accomplish these realities. The blood here that is shed accomplishes it all. The blood shed once and for all, finally by the Lord Jesus. Water accompanying the blood. The water here symbolizing the cleansing and the new life and the Holy Spirit. Outpouring of water from Jesus' side indicating that his death becomes the source of our life. 
Uh, these two realities, water and, and blood. John, with these, John speaks of Jesus' death as bringing us life. The events surrounding Jesus' death were not a plan gone awry. Things do not get out of God's control. But all of this is to fulfill Scripture. In verse 36, John connects Jesus to the Passover lamb whose bones were not broken. Verse 37 identifies Jesus as the Messiah foretold in Zechariah 12, whose suffering would cause his people unspeakable grief as they behold his pierced body. And yet, Zechariah speaks also of the result of the Messiah's suffering. Zechariah 13.1, he says, On that day there shall be a fountain opened, a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And here is that fountain. It's a fountain flowing from the side of our crucified Savior. As the water flowed from the rock in the wilderness and brought Israel life, there in that place of death, so too the water and the blood flowing from Jesus' side brings life to the dead. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It was not at all uncommon in the ancient world, as it is not all, at all uncommon in our world, for kings to shed the lives of others in order to preserve their own. But Israel's king and our king lays down his life, sheds his own blood in order to save the lives of his enemies. Brothers and sisters, this is your savior. And this is the source of your life. This is the so source of the forgiveness of our sins and the new resurrection life that is ours in Christ. And it is this Christ who's the object of our faith. We must always remember that, that Christ is the object of our faith. We are saved by Christ. Christ saves sinners, not an abstraction, grace, not a covenant as important as these things are, not even faith as important as faith is, but Christ in whom we believe. Christ saves sinners. A king Beaten, a king mocked, and dying on a Roman cross. Pilate found such a king laughable. If he's worth taking any time at all, it's time spent best mocking him. The religious leaders of the Jews, the chief priests, found such a king an offense. Surely if God were to send a king, his Messiah, he would overthrow the Romans and he wouldn't overthrow our temple. Surely the most obvious evidence that a man is uh, not God's Messiah, that this is not the anointed one in whom we have hoped, is that he would be dying on a cross. And here is Jesus of Nazareth, hanging on a cross. And yet the sign spoke the truth, didn't it? it spoke the truth, and it spoke it to the world. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This is not a king who would be recognized by this world, but this is God's king. This is God's king who would gain through losing. He would triumph in defeat, and he would, get, he would bring life out of his own death. You know, in an effort to communicate as widely and as effectively as possible, we're told that the sign above Jesus' head was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. This was the language of the people, it was the language of the empire, and it was the language of commerce and international communication. Again, we see that Pilate's goals are foiled. Right? In the death of Jesus, God is declaring to the world the triumph of his king. In these languages, we see the, the seed of the gospel going forth to the nations. All people everywhere in the Roman Empire could read and could understand exactly what is going on here. God is enthroning the king of his people. In the death of Jesus, God declares to the world the triumph of his king. 
And in this sign, we see the gospel going forth. Ironically, despite the goals of Pilate and the Jewish people, God's word, God's gospel will go forth to the world that in fact Jesus is king. And praise God for that. Amen. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for King Jesus. We thank you for his victory over sin, death, and the grave. We thank you for his triumph at the cross. And while the world would turn away in disgust, you, nevertheless, were turning your people toward the cross that every knee may bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is, in fact, both Lord and King. Father, would you exalt Christ in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives even this day, that we might in some small measure reflect something of the glory and honor of our great King, for we ask in his name, amen.